Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here from the Overflow Room to talk to you about the most iconic piece of English orchestral music. Yes, it's Elgar's Enigma Variations. Oh, my. I've been dreading this one. And you'll find out why in a moment. Not because my recommendations are going to be that bizarre, but because this piece has such a weight of history behind it and such an institutional feeling for propriety and what's correct and how to do it. This is the piece that every English conductor worth his salt has to conduct, and it is also the piece that every non-English conductor needs to do, usually with an English orchestra, because it's safer that way if you're making a recording anyway, or when you're visiting, everybody has to trot out the Enigma variations just to show that you can do something from England because it is a country which otherwise has nothing else worth doing. That, at least, was the attitude for much of the 20th century from people who did not live in England. And so, in a way, it's understandable just how the sort of parochialism of English critics and English journalists, when they talked about music, you know, sort of evolved that way. The truth of the matter is, as we all know, and as you've seen in these talks, there is fabulous 20th century English music. There really wasn't that much good stuff till Elgar came along. You know, the greatest English composer of the 19th century was Sir Arthur Sullivan, hands down. And I mean that in the most positive way. He was a truly great composer, superb at what he did. And they refused to re recognize that fact because, especially in England, because he was a master of comedy. And therefore, we need to find someone who was more serious, like a Stanford or a Parry or one of those guys from, you know, Sterndale Bennett, God knows who. All of these basically nobodies who were never as good as Sullivan because they weren't good at anything. While Sullivan was absolutely great at one thing and he mined that one thing superbly. Well, Elgar was unquestionably a great composer. And so when he trotted along um, and pulled out the Enigma variations around 1899, 1900, English music arrived, but it was a 20th century phenomenon. And Elgar was not as great a composer as Elgarians say he was. Now, this sort of who's greater than who, these questions are kind of stupid, actually, because once you reach a certain level of excellence, it really doesn't matter who's better or who isn't. After that, it's just a matter of opinion. And Elgar's excellence is absolutely unquestionable. He wrote a handful of masterpieces that are among the great masterpieces of music of, of any era. It's that simple. But the sense in which Elgar wasn't such a great composer is that he was not terribly prolific. He was not particularly enormously wide in his range of expression, although, again, he did have certain characteristic feelings and, and you know, his noble mente, his this, his that, that people sort of now regard as quintessentially British, and he did those things superbly well and uniquely. But would the question is, you know, if you want to if you want to think about greatness in terms of would music be any different had this person never existed? The answer with Elgar is no, <laughs> it just wouldn't be. He was great at what he did. He was terrific. And he was a wonderful addition to the universe of music. But he wasn't really necessary. And that's something that I think Elgarians have to just come to grips with, because it's the truth. He was great at what he did, but he was not necessary. So the chief of these great but not necessarily necessary pieces is the Enigma Variations. It is a fabulous piece. It's absolutely wonderful, delightful, almost as good as the March of the Mughal Emperors, which, as I pointed out before, is truly Elgar's masterpiece, his greatest piece of music in any form, because it uses both a tam-tam and a gong, and you never hear it that way. But, you know, the Enigma, variations is, the Enigma Variations is done by everybody constantly. And I'm doing this talk from the Overflow Room because I have a lot of performances here. I mean, it's one of those pieces that kind of metastasizes as you, as you collect recordings, particularly if you collect Elgar recordings, because it can be, it's only 29 minutes long. So it has to be coupled with other things. And those other things can range the gamut 
from other English things to other Elgar things to other variation things. There can be many, many options for what you're going to put with the Enigma variations. And so as time goes on, they tend to accumulate. Now, the Enigma Variations consists of a theme plus 15 variations, each one of which represents one of Elgar's friends, the first one of which is his wife, the last one of which is himself, and all of his other pals come on in the middle in one, one form or another. And it, it's, it's, really, it's really just a, a perfect piece of music. It is audibly based on Dvorak's symphonic variations, the shape of the theme, even though it's quite a bit longer, it's an ABA type theme, as was Dvorak's, and possibly also the Brahms Haydn variations. These are the kinds of works that did something similar to what Elgar did in the Enigma variations, but the Enigma variations is larger in scope and ambition, and it is gloriously scored. It has an organ at the end, which Elgar liked to pop in here and there. Um, the piece really does sound best if you have the organ, that sounds good, a good sounding organ, you can, you can add to it, but it's not 100% necessary if the conductor knows what he's doing. You can do without the organ. Now, this talk has 15 different recordings because the Enigma Variations has a theme and 14 variations, hence 15 movements. So as a tribute to the work, we're going to talk about 15 separate recordings, and there are many, 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 many more. 15 separate albums, actually maybe more recordings, there's just lots of them. And many, many conductors have done it more than once. Even conductors who you would not have expected to do it more than once. And that's kind of an interesting fact as well. So let's get started right away with these recordings and we'll see what we can learn from them because there's a certain bit of recorded history here too. I'm starting with the most controversial. The most controversial performance of the Enigma Variations has always been Leonard Bernstein's. And this, I think, is his second one. I think there's one on Sony. Yeah, I'm almost positive there's one on Sony. You know, this version caused a cow hysteria in the British press because it was so monumentally slow. It takes about, let's see, 39 minutes I think, or so, for a work, or 35 minutes, something like that, for a work that usually takes between 29 and 32 minutes. Now, almost all of that extra time is in the slow variation, Nimrod, which Bernstein turns into a genuine Mahlerian adagio. And whether you like that or not is going to be a matter of your personal taste, of course. And even if you don't like it, you have to just calm down and admit that once you get rid of the extra time for Nimrod, you basically have a very good normal performance of the Enigma variations. The other tempos are not so controversial. The circumstances of this performance were very, very well known. In fact, there's a video about them. Bernstein was obnoxious. He did not get on with the orchestra. They were obnoxious back. They had a lot of fighting. It's all been videotaped for our delectation, especially Bernstein has a snit with the first trumpet. But they really didn't like what he was doing. And so he got more obnoxious. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, shut your eyes, forget about the circumstance, and just listen to the recording. Boy, did they play. Maybe it's because they were pissed. <laughs> but they play really well. This is the, the BBC Symphony, by the way, that Bernstein was not getting along with. And they play fabulously. This disc is wonderful. And it's got one of the great ever, March of the Mogul Emperors. Yay! Melgar's greatest work. And of course, the first two pomp and circumstance marches. I think this is a really hot in the variations. It has a certain level of tension, maybe from the circumstances, maybe because it was just Bernstein. I don't want to know why. I only want to know what my ear tells me. I'm not bothered by the incredibly slow Nimrod variation. I'm really not. It's very, very beautifully done, very passionate, and the rest of it is just a ball buster of a performance. So that's the controversial enigma. And I really think, um, you know, people who, who like to talk about biographical details as opposed to listening to actual performances should just shut up and listen because it's very, very exciting. And, you know, by the way, the enigma, no one knows what the enigma is. Bernstein thought he knew what the enigma was. That was one of the things I think that annoyed the orchestra so much that he, that he, I think, tried to lecture them on what the enigma was. But Elgar said there is another theme that goes over and above the variations and is a counterpoint to them or to it or to the theme. No one is quite sure. So who cares? 
we don't know, we don't know. I don't worry about what we don't know. I worry about what we hear, what we actually listen to. And that is sort of going to be the topic, the overall riding theme of this talk, the enigma over the entire discussion. Because we really do, this is one of those pieces that people like to talk about, but they don't listen to, in the sense that, that you have to listen to what the interpreters do. Now, as another example of that, wait a minute, let's take a particularly iconic version, a very, very iconic version. It's Sir John Barberoli. Oh, yes, Sir John. Ha, 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 Sir John. And uh, he's with the, the Philharmonia here. This is a couple with Falstaff with the Halle. And, of course, it's in the huge Barbaroli box. And he recorded it more than once, like most English conductors did. Barbaroli's Enigma is the one that everybody loves to love because it just is supposed to be so emotionally emotionally rich and gushing and spontaneous and this and that. I played this. I, I really did play a lot of performances of this before doing this talk because I wanted to be sure I knew where I was. I was really shocked by just how faded and uninteresting this sounds. I, I never really loved it. I never did because I always thought there were better ones out there. But listening to this again, I, it just sounds tired to me. It really, really does. I, I don't know what to tell you. I don't think it's held up. I don't know if it ever did hold up. It may have held up in the UK where the competition was only amongst English conductors or uh, there was just a smaller pool of possible candidates back back in the day when this came out. When it was recorded in 63, I think so, or 64. So it was a while ago. And back in the 1960s, you had Adrian Bolt, you had this, there's a couple other things here and there, but it was a much smaller, smaller group. So Barberoli was a big fish in a little pond. Well, now the pond is a lot larger and the fish is a lot smaller. That's all I can tell you, folks. I just don't find this to be very persuasive anymore. I never really did, but I, I'm, as time has gone on, I've only been confirmed in that initial impression. Let me put it to you that way. Next, a little bit more of the historical. And here is a performance that has always also been somewhat controversial, Toscanini's. Now, Toscanini also did the Enigma Variations twice. He did it with the BBC Symphony back in the 30s. It's an EMI recording you can still get. It sounds like hell, but it's very, very good. And then he did it in 1952 with the uh, NBC Symphony. And it's terrific and very well recorded in the typically dry NBC way. But wow, do they play. And you can't say that Toscanini didn't know the piece. No way could you say that Tuscany didn't know the PC. He first conducted it in 1905 when it was brand spanking new. He knew it as well as any English conductor ever has or ever could. So come on, folks. You know, and Tuscanini was Tuscanini. But one thing he has taught us, and what he has taught us is you get the best results when you have the best conductors, preferably with the best orchestras. Now, the NBC Symphony was good, not great. They were about as good as most of the London orchestras, to be honest with you, that played the Enigma Variations over the years. But stellar international caliber? No. But they did have Toscanini, who was one of the all-time great, 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 greats. And it's very interesting looking at, at my, my old friend Harris Goldsmith's note for this recording. Harris was a terrific Toscanini partisan, and, and he wrote as follows which I think is very, very interesting. Um, let's see. Toscanini once asked, here we are, let's see. Let me get to the, the little paragraph here. Okay. Toscanini once asked Sir Arthur Bliss if he, quote, as an English musician, that's Bliss, thought that I, as an Italian, take the slow movements of Beethoven rather fast, unquote. Sir Arthur's response to this pointed question was not recorded, but there is written evidence of how touchy how touchy the English could be when others played their music. When the maestro played the Enigma Variations in London in 1930 with, touring, well, you know, with the touring New York Philharmonic, and again in 1935 when he guest conducted the BBC Symphony, some resident critics, while dutifully praising the virtuosity and literalism eh, of the performance, faulted it for being un-English. 
The conductor, Sir Landon Ronald, dismissed such carping. Ronald said, quote, this great conductor rendered the work exactly as Elgar intended, and the composer's idiom has obviously no secret for Toscanini. Some of the best performances I have ever heard were from the composer himself, but Toscanini excelled because he has a genius for conducting, and Elgar had not. And so I am more than willing to go with the conductors who have a genius for conducting over those who have not. And that includes a lot of British conductors who have conducted Elgar, who are not a genius on the level of Toscanini. So this is a great and important recording of the Enigma Variations because it tells us what, what the English have always been afraid to admit, that, which is that Elgar, as a great composer, wrote great music, and great music is great, and its greatness is great no matter who does it and where they do it. But in order to admit that, they have to give him up. They have to let go of their provincial proprietary peck sniffiness when it comes to performances of the Enigma Variations and let the world have him. And so my perspective as a non-English person has been take each performance as it comes, let's hear it and let's see who does it. And I think the following results may surprise you a bit. With that, now let's turn to Sir Adrian, Sir Adrian Bolt, yes, that wonderful distinguished gentleman who recorded the piece four times. I don't like Bolt in the Enigma Variations. I don't dislike him. He knows it too well. He just knows it too well. I, he takes it for granted. Now, he, sh I'm sure, would never say that. The musicians would probably, you know, kill me for suggesting it because he was a very serious musician and a very, a very intense musician in his way. And I am a caring musician, and so I don't mean it that he takes it for granted in the sense that he doesn't care. What I mean is, when you have an orchestra that is overly familiar, and a conductor who is incredibly familiar, and they don't really need to work that hard, um, they don't. <laughs> and I always get a sense, listening to Adrian Bolt's Enigmas, that they're, they're very pretty and very idiomatic and they go the way they're supposed to go, but there's a certain lack of tension or edge or bite to the music. And I think other conductors have simply rendered it with more freshness and, and more sheer gusto than Sir Adrian ever managed. And again, again, it, it's not a function of how good it was in the day. It's a function how, of how good it is compared to everything else that's out there. So, Bolt, very good, historical, important, yes, idiomatic, yes, but you can do better. And that's the point. You can do better unless you're buying 50 versions of the Enigma Variations. Get the five or ten best. And I don't think Bolt's in that pile. So there he goes. One that most certainly should be in that pile and that I think will fascinate you especially if you're English, is Ormandy in Philadelphia. This is the Japanese Ormandy English music disc, which has, it has, it's really kind of cool what you get here. You get the Enigma Variations, the Cocaine Overture, the Walton Violin Concerto with Zeno Francescati, the Vaughan Williams Talis Fantasia, probably the best one of those ever, um, the Fantasia on green sleeves, and a stunning Delius collection of Brig Fair, Dance Rhapsody Number no. 2 on Hearing the First Cuckoo in Spring, and In a Summer Garden. This is one hell of a beautiful disc. You may say it is not idiomatic. It doesn't have the organ at the end of the Enigma, but it's very interesting. The timing is 29 minutes, which is exactly the same as Toscanini's, like within seconds. Toscanini was not fast and cold and rigid, and Ormandy is not fast and cold and rigid either. He's not soft and decadent and slushy and self-regarding and, and, and decadent or any of those things. It's a wonderfully lithe, nimble, incredible performance. And one of the things that I like so much about it is that it's like I said, great conducting, great orchestra, great results. That's what you have here. Plain and simple. Listen just to Troit. You know, that's the variation with the timpani. You know, usually the timpani are either this sort of muddle, this sort of, you know, slide, you know that eventually turns into real notes, or they're just really loud and kind of brutal. You will never hear a more musical, purely musical performance of that variation than this one, because the timpanist was stunning, and he plays 
with the right sticks. I don't know how he does it, but there's a real dialogue between the timpani and the orchestra, and it's so musical and exciting. It's marvelous. And that's really a hallmark of the performance. Time and again, you hear details like that, just just effects of sheer perfect musicality that, that suits Elgar, because like I said, it's great music. The better you play it, the greater it sounds. So Ormandy and Philly is absolutely wonderful. Another one that's really a hoot and that you really ought to give a, give a chance is Toscanini with the Czech Philharmonic. Yes, our good friends, the Czech Philharmonic. Now here is another, another quotation that belongs in my my list of unbelievably stupid remarks by English critics. Wait till you hear wait till you hear this thing. Okay. Here we go. In the notes. Let's see. Okay. Elgar scholar Gerald Northrop Moore was to write in Gramophone that quote, against the foreign accents. Oh must be set all sorts of novel subtleties, which justify themselves immediately as intensely musical, musical insights. What a shock that is. The entire performance has an astonishing personality of its own. It is very much a performance for Elgarians as well as for Stakowskians. All right, what is this bullshit about foreign accents? Show me a foreign accent because the Czech woodwinds play the crap out of the piece and sound 20,000 times more characterful, characterful than their English counterparts? Is that a foreign accent? There's no such thing. We're only talking about music, folks. There is music. There is musicality. There is more musicality. There is less musicality. This is a lot of fun. It's Toscanini at his best and the Czech Philharmonic, which is a stunning group. And I know some of you will say, well, you know, I have it in for English critics. And I do. I mean, I admit it. I do. I think most of them are horrible. I think most American critics are horrible. I think most critics are horrible. You may think I'm horrible. I mean, if you read German critics or French critics or Italian critics, you're going to come up with the same kind of crap. The problem is provincialism, nationalism, this stupid idea that, there, that, that great music has to be done in a way that only certain people from a certain place with a certain background can get. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes it is. But if you claim that the music is classical, that is, that, it's, that, it, that it transcends the circumstance, the place, the time of its creation, that we want to listen to it today, then it transcends mere provincialism. And that's what drives me crazy in all this nationalist criticism I read. I happen to be English. I read you know, American. I read English, English language. So I read mostly American and English critics. But I also read German critics and French critics. And I know, <laughs> I know what they say. It's no more intelligent. Believe you me, folks. It's just as bad in its own way. I hate that stuff. It drives me crazy because it, it demeans the music. At the bottom line. And comments like that about foreign accents, I mean, it demeans Elgar. I mean, happily, it was a positive review. Yes. Okay. The guy, I mean, give him credit. He liked the performance because, of course, Tchaikovsky was British. Imagine if it had been Carl Angerl. What would the review have said? That's the question. So, there's Tchaikovsky. Now I'm just going to go through a bunch of, oh my goodness, I have so many of them here that are just very, very good. And these, I think, are the best of the Brits, some of them here. Um, this one, this is Andrew Davis with the BBC Symphony. Of course, Andrew Davis has done this thing a batch of times. I mean, everybody's done it a batch of times. But this is so well played and well recorded. It's a beautiful, middle of the road, idiomatic English performance of the Enigmas. So that one's really good. Next, Norman Del Mar. Who pays any attention to this? Norman Del Mar was just a terrific conductor of a lot of things. He was had very, very international taste. Remember, he wrote the book on Richard Strauss's orchestral works. And so, and so, you know, he didn't go all in for the English thing, but boy, he did good Elgar. And this is a wonderful Enigma variations with the Royal Philharmonic on Deutsche Grammophone, coupled with the five pomp and circumstance marches, also splendidly done. First class. And it's good to see something from Norman Del Mar. There's just not that much. It's still around, you know. Then we have, well, a few of some American ones. Ooh, Andrew Lytton. This was one of his first recordings for Virgin. 
Now, he has since redone the Enigma Variations, not as well in my opinion. This is with the Royal Philharmonic also. Again, first of all, it's magnificently recorded. You want to hear a great recording sonically, but the organ perfectly touched it at the end. It's really a knockout. It, it comes with the Serenade and In the South, both fabulous performances. But this is one of those, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's American because he's American. I mean, I, that stuff is silly. He was a young conductor feeling his oats, and it's a very fresh and, and just, I think, exciting, straight ahead, Take No Prisoners performance. I, I, I love listening to it, especially sonically. It's amazing. Another sonically amazing performance is this one. David Zinman, you get the Cocaine Overture, Serenade in E minor, and Salut d'Amour, along with the Enigma variation. This thing got a rosette in the old Penguin Guide. They were going to be nice to an English orchestra and an English conductor, I mean, American orchestra and American conductor, if it killed them. And this is the one they picked, and rightly so. It's, it's an absolutely first-class performance, wonderfully played, which shows you, of course, that the Baltimore Symphony was every bit as good as any of the English orchestras out there that were recording the Enigma Variations. And really, by the time this was done, which was, what is this, 80, late 80s, 89, something like that, Somewhere around there, the fact of the matter is most of the second tier orchestras, both in the UK, because remember there was there was Birmingham and Bournemouth and all those guys, in the UK, in the US, in Europe generally, they were better than most of the English orchestras were in the early 60s. When Bolt and Barbaroli and those guys at the LPO or the LSO, those were not good times for English orchestras. And that's when a lot of the stuff that we're talking about was recorded. So you've got Better orchestra, stunning sonics, amazing telarc sonics, a really sharp, wonderful conductor who is not excessively sentimental. Zinman was not a, a sentimentalist. I think part of his appeal to the English critics was that he did not wear his heart on, its, on his sleeve, as Bernstein did. And also Sinopoli or someone like that, who's, if you want Elgarian decadence, listen to Sinopoli's Elgar. Oh, boy, that's that's the really, the really decadent, fantasy, ecla, mentally diseased Elgar at <laughs> Sinopoli. I'm not even talking about those. But he did them. He, but he did them. Let's see. Oh, yes. Well, once again, we have the Cocaine Overture, the Pomp and Circumstance Marches with Adrian Bolt on this disc. But the Enigma Variations with Macaris. Now, Macaris did them twice, too. And it's Macaris. You know it's going to be good. His Elgar is wonderful. It's idiomatic and really punchy, really punchy. It is sort of the way, quite frankly, quite frankly, his performances are probably closest to the composer's own, only in great sound, absolutely great sound in their, in their unsentimental passion, because the passion is there, as it is in Elgar's own performances. He manages to keep it moving, but also emote in the way that, that you really need to in this music. It's very highly expressive emotional music. There's no stiff upper lip in Elgar or in the Enigma Variations, only in his photographs. And Macaris was a great exponent of the Enigma Variation, the Enigma Variations. This is his, his EMI version. It was on EMI Eminence. And I, I just think it's a knockout. I used to use this as a demo disc too. Slightly steely sound, but wow, the end with the organ comes piling in. Sounded marvelous. All right. Oh, back to the English people. Well, Macaris was Australian and American, but kind of English by adoption. And this is the London Phil with Bryden Thompson. Now, I liked Bryden Thompson. Bryden Thompson was just a conductor who I think um, he was not technically all that adept. He could be kind of sloppy, but but it, there's a certain a certain honesty. I think is the word. To, to everything that he did. His performances of the Elgar symphonies were very controversial because they were very slow for their day and also very blowsily recorded by, you know, the, by Chandos. You know, Chandos had two kinds of sort of sonic, sonic profiles. One was like good and one was like big and watery and diffuse. Well, this is one of the good ones. It is not big and watery diffu and diffuse, nor is it all that slow. And the couplings are really interesting. You get the sanguine fan, and you get the incidental music from Grania and Diarmid, whoever they were. 
So it's, it's worth considering. It's a very, very good performance in the English tradition, but a bit with a twist because Thompson was his own band. And I think this is really uh, the best of his Elgar. So worth pointing out. Now we have our top three. And none of them come from English conductors. None of them, not a one. First, Slatkin. I have praised Slatkin's Elgar before, and I shall continue to do so. Slatkin is a fantastic Elgar conductor. I have heard some naysayers since I praised his Elgar Second Symphony to the skies, particularly about the sonics. And my, uh, these are very well recorded. The sonics are very, very good, I have to say. And, you know, people, people, uh, say things about sonics when they don't have anything to say about the music. And these are wonderful, wonderful performances. Now, this enigma is a very sober and serious interpretation. And, you know, Slatkin gave an interview when he recorded it about how well Elgar was trying to find his way and it was a difficult time. And so the enigma variations represents his, his lack of lack of confidence at the beginning and grows to full confidence at the end, or I don't know, it was all kinds of nonsense. I don't know if I hear that or not in here. What I hear is a great performance by a great conductor of the Enigma Variations. Very, very well recorded and very well played by the London Philharmonic. Once again, it's marvelous, absolutely marvelous. And I have a feeling that if Adrian Bolt could have heard this, he would have been very, very happy. He would have wished he could have done it. I really think so. However, we're down to the top two. And they're really a tie, I think. They really are. They are They are both with the London Symphony Orchestra. And they are both foreign conductors. Pierre Monte and Eugen Jochum. Yes! This is what happens when you have a great international conductor pop in with the local hometown team and tell them how to do it right. That's exactly what they do. Monte is, you know, was absolutely a genius. So is Joachim. They both had something in common. What they had in common was this sense of, of an organic approach to the way that they conducted, to let the music flow effortlessly, speak without any kind of inhibition at all. They, I mean, they had the glamour. They had the sex appeal. They let the climaxes erupt, but they also keep everything in shape, everything in proportion. It's all perfectly balanced musically. They got the orchestral musicians to excel, absolutely excel, because, you know, this is the early 60s when the LSO was not doing so well, but Monte really made them play, and they sound great. Absolutely great for him. And here with Jochum, it's, it's, it's the same thing. This was a bit later. They were in better shape. This was 71, I think. By 1970, they, they, they'd gotten their, their act together a little more. But Jochum was just wonderful in this kind of music. You know, he was the greatest Brahms conductor out there at the time, probably. And he was doing the Brahms Symphony, as you'll recall, with the LPO for EMI, along with things like the Haydn Variations, which made the Enigma Variations the next natural step. And when this came out, even the English critics had to sit up and take notice. Of course, they sat up and took notice, largely because he was conducting an English orchestra. And it wouldn't do to trash a major international figure when he had one of your hometown ensembles on hand to play your hometown music. So English critics tend to be nice to conductors who come in and do it with English orchestras. That makes people like you know, Stokowski with the Czech Philharmonic or Zinman in Baltimore, God forbid, you know, all the more, all the more significant that they're so good because they are foreigners, those awful, icky, scary foreigners. So either one of these, take your pick. Joachim Monte, you got to have one. You got to have one of them. And you will really get a sense of how fabulous the Enigma Variations can be. Much better, frankly, than if you've got Barbarola or Bolt. And I hate to say it, but folks, it's true. I trust my ears. And yeah, of course, you'll trust yours too. But I did a lot of comparative listening before doing this talk. And I hope that uh, when I hear from you, you'll do at least some. Do a little bit. Compare some things. Do some really close listening. And see what your ears tell you. I'm very interested to know. I truly am. So 
Keep on listening, folks. Thank you for joining me. We have solved the enigma.